Hello, my name is uh, Tomasz Kolankiewicz. I'm the artistic director of the Polish Film uh, Festival in Gdynia. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, to invite you for the webinars on the production of films for the young audience. I'm very happy to collaborate with the New Horizons, uh, with Kids Film uh, Forum, the major player of the Polish uh, youth uh, cinema. And I made the, uh, the topic of the youth uh, cinema the, the main point of the, the Gdynia industry sessions uh, this year. I have a strong uh, conviction that the Polish film for young audience is on the rise uh, and uh, for a few years now we are we are watching uh, uh, more and more productions in this year's main competition we have uh, one film um, dedica dedicated to the to the young audience to young adults and so I'm very happy that the Polish uh, film for young audience is growing in the in the recent years because there was uh, quite a big setback in the past years. Uh, so now I have a feeling that this is a good time to, to talk about it. And, uh, and I'm very happy that, uh, that we can, uh, alongside the, the, the Kids Film uh, Forum, we can provide you with these webinars. And I hope that uh, you will be able to make uh, another great productions. And I'm eager to take them under considerations regarding the selection of the, uh, of the Polish Film uh, Festival in Gdynia. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dobry uh, wieczór. My name is Maciej Jakubczyk and I'm director of uh, Kids Kino International Film Festival from Warsaw. Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Katarzyna Janiak. I'm the project manager of the Kids Kino industry, which is part of the Kids Kino International Film Festival. 
Hello, welcome, and I'm Viola Gabrielli, the programmer and executive producer of Kids Kino Industry. Uh, I have the pleasure also to be board member of New Horizons Association. Uh, and actually, we established Kids Kino as a sort of idea how to work with uh, family films, films for young audience in general, in a sort of uh, 360 mode. Um, with a festival, Kids Kino, Kino Dzieci in Polish uh, International Film Festival at heart, but also with a distribution program and educational program where we show European mostly art house and niche uh, good quality family movies, but also with a, a, a number of uh, initiatives that support production of uh, films for young audiences with uh, Kids Kino Lab, um, uh, whose Filip Lazernik, our tonight's star uh, tutor is since the very beginning. And uh, Kids Kino Industry, which is um, uh, the, the, the co-production forum, pitching forum, which is taking place every September um, uh, in Warsaw. And um, this is a very, very, very nice moment for us here at the festival and in Gdynia, uh, a Polish film festival. Uh, where for the very first time since ages, the, uh, the film uh, uh, for family audience is actually the part of the main competition. Uh, it's called Tarapaty Dva, the triple trouble. Uh, and we are very happy that uh, this project uh, came up from um, as an alumni of our uh, Kids Kino Lab development program. Yeah, and with the Kids Kino industry, we create a meeting place where European professionals can exchange ideas, experiences, and de develop new content for children, as well as we help them at our platform to uh, bring them together with potential co-producers, distributors, sales agents, broadcasters, and film funds. With the Kids Kino Industry talks like today, uh, we would like to maintain an engaged and connected community of audiovisual content creators and commissioners for young audiences and keep you updated with current industry threat topics and trends. We have started this morning with a journey to the East and discussed on how to co-produce with China. Then we um, had an online discussion with, uh, on how to shape production between art house and family entertainment with Lontin Petit, Moritz Heminger and Eva Puszczyńska. Now I would like to present you on uh, uh, one of the kids uh, Kino Lab tutor, Filip Lazevnik, writer of screenplay for, for several um, Disney and DreamWorks animated features, including Potra Pocahontas, Mulan, and Prince of Egypt. Philip will introduce us uh, to the screenwriting process for young audiences and tickle topics like the importance of the story development process, the role of the audience in the film, how to be ruthless with your own creations, and how to use Jason Alexander's actor question when writing scenes. There, of course, uh, will be uh, time for a Q&A session at the end of um, this masterclass. For those of you who are watching uh, us on YouTube, if you have any question, please ask the chat function on the right uh, hand side on under your live stream window on this YouTube link if you leave the full screen models. The chat is open through the session and our chat moderator, Ula Pogorzelska, will transfer your question directly to Philip. Uh, for the Kids Kino Lab participants who are with us on the Zoom, welcome everybody. Uh, if you have any question, please raise your hand and I will um, give you time to, um, to ask the question directly to Philip. And now I have a pleasure to hand the word over to Philip Lazepnik. Philip, the time is yours. I thanks. Uh, I can see some of you, and of course, some of you on YouTube I can't see, but I hope this will be a conversation. Uh, and by the way, if uh, anybody was puzzled by the music at the start, that's actually from the cast album of uh, the musical uh, Prince of Egypt, which I wrote the book for, uh, which was on the West End, having a little hiatus for some reason, but is supposed to, to come back before, before too long. So uh, the topic was thinking big, writing small, sort of the connection between the lessons I've learned from 
writing big studio films uh, that I've transferred to European films. And I've worked on several big studio films in Los Angeles, Pocahontas, Milan, and Prince of Egypt, among other things. And since I moved to Denmark several years ago, I've worked on numerous smaller budget independent movies throughout Europe. And I'm asked all the time, what's the difference between working on a big studio movie and a European movie? And the short answer is nothing. Because making a movie in many ways is the same if you have a budget of $300 million or 3 million euros. And the screenwriting, the, the, the filmmaking tools I learned to use at the big studios are the same tools I use for lower budget movies here in, in Europe. And I should say that in my discussion that's gonna follow, I'll be talking mainly about family films since I've written so many of them. What I'll be saying applies to all sorts of films, I think. Uh, and also these are tools, screenwriting tools, which we discuss in detail in the Kids Kino Workshop, which I'm a mentor for. Uh, and although we don't have time to go into the detail here that we do in the workshop, I'll be going over some of the bigger points. And I'll say right up front what I always say to uh, workshop participants, which is there are no rules and regulations for writing a script. There's nothing objectively right or wrong in a script. All I can do when I talk is take my own experience and from that talk about how I approach a story. And you have to keep in mind always, I come from a big studio Hollywood commercial background. So I'm coming from a very specific viewpoint. That's true of anyone who, who talks about this. So, you know, what I think may not apply to all projects, to all people, but, you know, you can pick and choose what's useful for you and discard the rest. So, you know, let's start off with how a big movie and a small movie are, are similar. Uh, you know, a, a common misconception that I encounter all the time uh, is that when I was writing a movie at Disney or DreamWorks, everybody always thinks that the process was very corporate. They think that there are focus groups and test screenings and meetings with marketing and PR and scientific studies of audience demographics. And when I first started at Disney, I thought the same thing. I kept expecting that we'd be meeting with toy manufacturers and marketers and promotion people. And I was surprised because none of that happened. There was a wall between the creative team on one side and the business side on the other. Uh, we never met, we never talked. And, and I'll give you an example of that on Pocahontas. In early drafts of Pocahontas, we had a possum. Uh, there are all these animals that were the friends of Pocahontas and uh, one of them was a possum. And later I learned, because it takes years to make a toy from the very first concept drawings to the manufacturer and the distribution, uh, I learned the toy company started working on making a plush toy of the possum. And they had already manufactured their first versions of the toy when we made a decision that we didn't need a possum since we had a raccoon already, a raccoon like the mascot of a uh, kid's kino. Uh, so we cut it. And we didn't realize at the time that, that meant hundreds of thousands of dollars, thousands of man hours were thrown into the trash instantly. Uh, the toy company had to cut the possum from the production line. And we never heard a word about it because ideally you make creative decisions based on whether your choices strengthen or weaken the story, not based on merchandising or marketing or anything. It's as true for a small independent movie as for a big studio movie. Now, I'm well aware that nowadays in LA, perhaps that rule is broken more than uh, the, it's, it's, it's kept in big commercial movies. So I think that's an advantage for the smaller film because the only way to make a movie is to make a movie based on uh, your creative choices. Uh, I'll give you another bigger example. Pocahontas is a musical, music by Alan Menken, lyrics by Stephen Schwartz. This is where I met Stephen and you know we're still working together on the Prince of Egypt musical. Uh, near the end of the movie, there's a scene where John Smith is tied up in a tent in the Indian village and Pocahontas sneaks in to see him the night before he's gonna be executed by Pocahontas' father, the chief. And 
there was a song in the scene, If I Never Knew You. It was a love ballad sung by John Smith. Uh, John Smith was played by Mel Gibson in his pre-crazy days, uh, who had agreed to sing the song. He had never sung on the screen before, so he was taking voice lessons. There was a recording session with a full orchestra, and the, they decided the song was going to be the film's big top 40 song. So a pop version was written and recorded. The entire scene was animated. And all along, I was a little skeptical about putting a ballad so close to the end of the movie, but I was overruled. Ruled. And there was uh, one test screening. I've, I've said there aren't a lot of uh, the focus groups of test screening, but we did have one test, uh, one preview screening of Pocahontas a, a couple of months before the premiere. The movie was almost complete. There were some sequences still in animatics. There was some temp dialogue and rough edits and so forth, but you could see the movie. So we were all packed into limos and we we're driven up to Santa Barbara. The creative team, the Disney execs, along with Michael Eisner, who's the head of the company, and Roy Disney, uh, Walt Disney's nephew. And when we arrived, I was horrified to see the audience because it was almost all teenagers. And I thought the worst possible audience for Pocahontas. But the film went great. The teenagers were with the story from the very beginning all the way almost to the very end, all the way up to the moment where Pocahontas entered that tent and John Smith began to sing, if I never knew you. And it was as if a switch had been pulled. Half the audience got up, went out to the lobby to get popcorn and Cokes. The other half was talking to each other. They're throwing paper wads at each other. They were sleeping. We'd lost the audience. And after the screening, we, we went outside in the lobby and everyone instantly agreed the song had to go. Millions of dollars, recordings of the song, a fully animated sequence, even worse, a whole music campaign geared around putting the song on the radio and in the top 40s, but it hurt the movie and it had to uh, be cut. So in my experience, and of course, maybe I lived in the golden age of uh, animated features. In my experience, so every decision at DreamWorks and Disney was a creative decision. It has to be because the only way to make a movie is to make a movie that you want to see. Uh, at the big studios, we we're always trying to make the best movie we could make. We never tried to make a box office hit because you can't. You can't second guess what the audience might want. That way is disaster. It's proven again and again by box office bombs. Uh, the only thing that you can do, the only thing that I ever do is to make a movie that I want to see. Uh, whether it's a movie, a small, tiny, small movie in, in, in Europe or a, or a big Hollywood film. It's ironic because I found that it's in Europe that producers and studios and distributors are obsessed with the age group of their audience. At Disney DreamWorks, I don't remember a single conversation ever about demographics. We were making movies for everyone. Uh, in Europe, I have discussions all the time about target audiences. People want to say, is the age group between seven and a half and 11 years old or nine and 12? Or uh, at least people try to have these discussions with me because I have no interest in it. So anyway, the short answer to the question, what are the differences between writing a big Hollywood studio film and a small European movie is nothing. But the longer answer is there are a lot of differences. Uh, I'll run through a few of them. Uh, money, of course, but the, the advantages of having a lot of money aren't always what you think. The primary advantage of a Hollywood studio is that they have money for the movie up front. It means ironically in many ways you have more creative freedom than in an independent movie. First of all, there's just one person who signs off on the budget and has the final decision over the context of a movie. At my time at Disney and then at DreamWorks, that one guy was Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was the president of Disney and then was the co-owner of DreamWorks. And it was him. Ultimately, the buck stopped with, with, with him. In Europe, films often have several co-producers from different countries. You often have conflicting notes, conflicting visions of the movie. Each one has veto power over the film. So that's sometimes a challenge. Uh, but I would say that the big difference is that the money makes up the process different. In the studio system, once you're greenlit, there are no interruptions. You have your team from the start to the finish. You have a schedule. You can take the time you need to get the story perfect before moving on to pre-production. And the European funding system, as 
you all well know, is usually government film institutes doling out money in measured doses. It has its advantages, uh, but the disadvantage, of course, is that the process keeps stopping and starting. You get some money, you gather people, you work until the next application period, and then you stop and uh, wait for the next cash to come in. And often the result is that producers have to rush through the development process to get to the production phase so that movies wind up getting filmed before the script is really ready. But the advantage of the European system, and it's a huge advantage, is that you have a better chance of making unusual, unique, unexpected stories. Uh, you know, many, if not most movies in Hollywood, certainly these days are cookie cutter movies. They're safe and conventional and formulaic stories. But uh, you have the chance here, and I have had the chance to, to, to make uh, unexpected stories. Another difference is the mindset of filmmakers. Hollywood, of course, is devoted to making commercial movies. Uh, and the heart and soul of the commercial filmmaking world is the family film. And actually, I don't like to use the term children's film. Uh, I think a, a good so-called children's film speaks to adults as much as it does to children, includes everyone. Uh, but family films are where the money is. It's the bulk of the industry. Marvel comic book movies and fantasy movies, action movies, comedies, and filmmakers in LA move between so-called adult films and children's movies all the time. They don't see any difference in them. And too often in Europe, these things that people call children's movies are considered to be B movies, sort of a film ghetto, second class. I've encountered directors or filmmakers of course, who are sometimes embarrassed to work on family films. They look at it as slumming and it is total nonsense. I mean, just set aside the fact that without children learning to love movies, there's gonna be no audience for adult films. Uh, it's harder to make a good family film than an art house movie. Classic family films connect more directly with the heart of an audience than many other adult movies. I've never felt, and I've written many, shall we say, adult movies and TV series. Also, I've never felt, you know, that I was speaking down to a family audience in any, any sort of way. Again, though, to learn more about this, you know, that's absolutely what we talk about in the workshop at the kids' uh, Kino Lab. So there are similarities, there are differences between the two systems. Uh, but really what I'm talking about are the screenwriting tools I brought over from Hollywood and I use in Europe. And I have these mantras uh, that I often use that I've developed over the years and uh, which I will talk about. First one is know what your movie is about. Uh, you know, it's interesting because the first two weeks of Pocahontas, uh, there was a, a creative team of about 30. The directors, the producers, uh, the writers, there were three of us writers who worked as a team on, on Pocahontas. Uh, and the, the heads of stories and the story artists, and the animators, there were about 30 people who, who had creative say in the movie. And the first two weeks, everyone sat around and they came up with a sentence that summarized what the movie was about. And at the time, I thought it was silly. I thought it was a preposterous waste of time. And we writers would, would make fun of it. As time went on, I've looked back on this and seen that actually there was a lot, there was a big uh, uh, use for, 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 for doing this. We started off on Pocahontas with a, a, a team of 500 people working on the movie. And it was 500 people working on 500 different movies. And by the end, the goal was to have 500 people working on the same one movie. And that applies to a creative team of a hundred or of 10 or of two, you have to be working on the same movie. I do a lot of consulting for movies in trouble. And when I come in often, the first thing I'll ask is what is your movie about? And people say, oh, well, that's easy. you know. And then, then one person will say one thing, another person say, well, actually I would say that the movie is, is about this. And pretty soon you realize that they don't have the same concept, what their, their movie is about. Uh, so that's first and foremost, the, the, the most important thing. 
Uh, there are other mantras I've learned the hard way because when I started out, I was writing much different sorts of things than I do now. And the, I think the most important lesson that I learned, and it's now it seems sort of silly that I didn't know it, but I certainly didn't, uh, is that movies are not about ideas. They're about feelings. Every movie, whether it's an action film or a romantic comedy or a horror film, it lives or dies depending on whether the audience cares about the characters and what happens to them. It's the emotional story of the characters that carries the film, the wants and needs of each person. Again, in the workshop, we go a lot into wants and needs. And a corollary to this, you know, some people view their screenplay or their film that they're making as a vehicle for expressing their innermost fears and dreams and hopes and emotional wounds. They let it all come out. And my reaction to this is always, I don't care how you're feeling. I care about how the audience watching the movie feels. Uh, and it's interesting. Often I've found that when I have a screenplay and when a writer has poured their heart into it and they reveal their deepest secrets, they can't read their own script without crying. Often it's those screenplays that are the most banal and boring and trite to an audience. It's worked great to the writer, but the audience has not lived the life of the writer, and so they're left cold. Uh, and an example of that, I worked on a movie. It started off with this, this good high concept. It was a mystery drama thriller centered around a woman who turned out not to exist. It became a movie about a fight between a mother and her teenage daughter. The daughter wasn't doing chores. She was skipping school. Eventually, she ran away. And really nothing happened in the story, but it came from the writer's personal experience and she found it very deeply moving. It was dramatic to her. It certainly wouldn't be for an audience. Of course, the movie never got made. You know, and of course you have to mind your personal experiences when writing, obviously, but you have to be a cold hearted, ruthless professional in how you use those experiences. Uh, another, Thing that I always say is what you see is what you get. Film and TV are a, a visual medium. Uh, and you know, writers and filmmakers in general are usually very smart people. And when I ask them questions like, why is your character doing this? Why is this scene in the movie? What is this movie about? They can always come up with really clever explanations. They can explain the ideas behind the scene, the, the, the reasons why they wrote it. And I always say that's great if you had footnotes on the screen that referred you back to the clever ideas of the writer, but you're not around to explain what's going on, all these great ideas. The audience is experiencing the characters and the story as it happens in real time, and they have to be able to follow. And all they know is what they see on the screen, nothing else. Uh, and then I'm talking a lot about the audience. So another, uh, motto that I have is the audience comes first. Now, when I say this, you have to remember, I'm a commercial filmmaker. I am out to sell tickets and I'm not ashamed about being out to sell tickets. Uh, I've run into people in, in, in Denmark where, where I'm living now who their movie has come out and they've had uh, 2000 people who went to see it. And I, at the beginning, would be sort of embarrassed and I would tread, and I was astonished to find out they weren't embarrassed at all. They were fine because they had made the movie that they wanted to make, but they didn't sell any tickets. I'm always thinking of the audience watching in the theater or at home in front of their screens or even, God forbid, on a phone, you know, on a train. If there's one thing that separates a commercial film from an art house film, I think it's the attitude towards the audience. The filmmakers who think I'm going to tell the story I want to tell. If there's an audience that wants to see it, great. If nobody wants to see it, I don't care. Well, I do care. And it's not an attitude that you can have in commercial entertaining. Again, though, uh, the tricky thing about this is you can't write second guessing what the audience wants to see. All you can do is write the, 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 the movie that you want to see. That is true. But you do it remembering that there are people sit, sitting in seats uh, uh, watching it. Um, also, when writing a commercial 
action film or comedy or horror film, I find it often a useful exercise to come up with four or five tent pole scenes that are the big attractions. Uh, if it's a musical, it's the, 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 the big songs like Let It Go in, in, in Frozen. If it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, if it's an action film, then it's, it's the big car chase, but it's a car chase that's done in a new special way. It's the poles that hold up the tent of the story. It's not a bad way to approach any sort of story because you have to say, what are the scenes that people are gonna go away remembering? How does your story support those tent pole scenes? How do you get from one big sequence to another? Uh, often I encounter scripts that just kind of go along and one thing sort of blends into another and you come out and there's nothing really in specific that you remember uh, from the movie. But for instance, something about uh, the, the Mary, uh, the, you remember the, the big, you know, a uh, hair scene. Uh, in Airplane, there are th all these big comic moments that you remember. Uh, it's true of many successful movies that they're, that the movies are almost built around the attractions in the same way that a, a, a carnival is. Um, it's also important to write interesting characters. You know, that seems like it goes without saying, but it does need sign saying you have to remember that the first audience for a script are often stars. Uh, in order to get a movie made, you need some big actors to sign on. And actors read a script to see if the character they play has big juicy scenes. Is there a battle? Is there an emotional breakdown? Is there a big conflict or an inspirational moment or some triumph? You see this in Shakespeare all the time, by the way. In scene after scene, you see that there are showpieces for actors. Beatrice and Benedict, you know, the big uh, the love quarrels, the, 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 the uh, uh, soliloquies for Hamlet. I mean, he was very conscious of writing stuff that actors could sink their uh, teeth into. Movies are about people. These people have to be compelling. An another motto I have is cut out the boring parts. Uh, the best movies are those that grip an audience from the start and don't let go. So if a scene can be cut, it should be cut. There are shoe leather scenes, getting from one place to, a, to, a, to another, cut those. Cut out all the explanations. Cut out as much exposition as you can. You'll be surprised how little explanations you can get away with. If a scene is 10 pages long, cut it in half. If it's three pages long, cut it down to two. If a character has a dozen lines, cut a couple to, to find a couple to, to, to cut. You know, cut adjectives. You know, even right now, I am undergoing this. Uh, I've spent, it's been like eight years now writing the theatrical version of The Prince of Egypt up to the point where it opened on, on the West End. And the songwriter is Stephen Schwartz. He's a songwriter, but he's a brilliant storyteller and editor for that matter. And every draft of the book that I've, you know, Stephen Schwartz went through and he would suggest cutting stretches of dialogues, first pages, then reams of dialogues, then lines, eventually down to individual words, you know, to the point where I had to sometimes fight back. But the instinct is really good. Less is more. Uh, and you have to learn how to cut. Uh, I know there's some people from previous workshops here, and I don't know if anybody remembers, I think you do, there was a workshop where there was a script that came in, fabulous script, great script, it was about 40 pages too long, and they didn't know how to cut it, and I said, okay, we're going to do it right now, and we went through, and in an hour, cut 40 pages out. And it was sort of like a parlor trick because people were astonished saying, how in the world did you do that? But it's easy after years and years of experience to see what's necessary. Uh, there are whole, you know, gobs of things. So whole detours and, 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 and uh, sequences that, uh, that you, you, you realize, well, if it didn't exist, it wouldn't make any difference to the story. You just can't be self-indulgent. Another way of putting it is you have to kill your babies. Uh, you might have, there's one scene which is the thing that inspired you to write your movie. 
It's, or it's a scene that you rewrote 50 times and you've polished every single line till it glitters and it's, it's, it's perfect. Or there's a character who comes from your favorite act or you've put something in a script for, as an homage to your wife or, or you're tipping your hat to some mentor. If it doesn't support the characters and the story, cut it. You know, it seems to be a golden rule that you always wind up having to cut your favorite scene. A professional writer is heartless about their own material. And I'll give you an example. In Aladdin, uh, Aladdin was, uh, the, the songs were written by Howard Ashman and Alan Menken. Alan Menken is, is still writing songs for, for everybody, for, for Broadway and, and Disney. Howard Ashman was the lyricist. And Howard Ashman was really the genius behind the golden age, the second golden age of, of Disney musical films. Uh, he was a brilliant story man in addition to being a brilliant lyricist. But he died very young. He died of AIDS uh, during the making of Aladdin. And for Aladdin, he had written a song about Aladdin's mother. It really was a song about his own mother. Uh, it was his homage uh, to her, you know, his last love letter to his mother. But there were discussions about whether you needed Aladdin's mother in the movie, because another golden rule of Disney movies is all mothers are dead. So, uh, so, so there was this discussion about this, and and Jeffrey Katzberg, uh, the, the the head of Disney at the time, visited Howard Ashman in the hospital on his deathbed, and literally on his deathbed, Howard Ashman pleaded with him to keep the song in the movie as a personal gift to him. And Jeffrey said, but it doesn't work in the movie. And he cut it. Uh, you have to be ruthless. Uh, nobody could be as ruthless as Jeffrey Kanzberg. Um, on a less dramatic note, I've always been interested in language. Uh, and I wrote a Star Trek episode, a Next Generation episode called Darmok, uh, centered around a language that the universal translator couldn't decipher because it turned out to be a language consisting of, of metaphors. Well, in Pocahontas, I had come up with this really ingenious way that Pocahontas learned English, a series of scenes. Uh, how do people learn to communicate when they don't have any you know, common uh, uh, tongue? Uh, but eventually, of course, it was taking up time and we had to cut it. We put a magic wind in that whooshed through and then they could speak to each other. Uh, another motto I have is don't join the logic police. It's the easiest note in the world. You find a small logical point and you worry it to death. If it's something that the audience buys at the time and you need an extra scene or line of dialogue to explain, don't bother with it. As an example, uh, when I was on Shrek for two seconds, the original voice actor for Shrek suddenly died. It was gonna be Chris Farley from Saturday Night Live. They brought in Mike Myers. And Mike Myers, also Saturday Night Live, had uh, uh, basically four voices. Uh, an English accent, which he did for Austin Powers, a German for Dieter, American for Wayne's World, and Scottish for Fat Bastard. And for Shrek, he chose a Scottish accent. And the first time I heard, I happened to be on the movie when the first voice recordings came in. I said, why is he Scottish? Shrek is Scottish? Nobody else was Scottish. And everybody around me is just shrugged and said, well, you know, Mike Myers. I mean, that's and I was so sure that the first thing when the movie came out, everybody would pounce on saying, why does Shrek have a Scottish accent? And you know what? I've never heard anyone say anything about that Scottish accent. For a moment, I had joined the logic police and I had to learn to, to, to quit. On the other hand, characters have to have a reason to act the way they do or say not because it's necessary for the writer to advance the plot. You have to believe the people up on screen. And you know, Jason Alexander, who was in uh, Seinfeld, uh, had, had, he's also a brilliant acting teacher. And he, I heard him talk about four questions that he asked actors. And the questions actually work well for writers and filmmakers also. The four questions are, who am I talking to? What do I want them to do? What am I going to do to make my partner do those things? And what's in the way? What's keeping you from getting this? So who am I talking to? Yes, you have to know who's in the scene. What do I want them to do? Uh, not think or say, but to do. Uh, you want 
a character wants another character in the scene to do something. You know, one of the banes of dialogue is banter. Writers love banter, witty, funny, clever uh, dialogue. That's just two characters uh, 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 sort of lightly joshing with each other. And it's the death of drama. And you always have to cut all banter when you come across it. Pete, there has to be a direct reason why a character in a scene is trying to make another character say, do something. Uh, the third question, what am I going to do to make my partner do those things? So it's not just a matter of talking. I mean, there has to be something driving the scene. Something has to drive an entire movie, but that's also true of an entire sequence or an entire scene. You have to have characters active. And then finally, what's in the way? What's keeping you from getting this? Which is another motto, which is conflict is good. Sometimes writers fall in love with their characters. They don't want bad things to happen to them. You have to put your characters through hell. You know, there are a lot of definitions of story. <clears throat> One is that someone climbs up a, a tree to get an apple and somebody throws stones at them trying to stop them. Don't forget the stone throwing part. And then, you know, one last lesson I've taken from my studio days, maybe the most important, you have to work harder than everyone else in the room. Ultimately, success comes to the best prepared to the hardest worker. I never walk into a room to pitch without having outlined and practiced every word that I'm going to say. If I'm up for a job, I have to sell myself to a producer. My goal is always to have done twice the amount of work that anyone else has. If I'm writing a film, I have an initial story conference. I come up with a complete story. Even if I know that there's a very good possibility the story will go into a completely different direction. If I'm consulting on a project, I have solutions for every story problem. You can never let up. An example, just last week, uh, I had an idea of there's a, a, an early, I heard in a podcast that, that Tim Rice and uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber had written a musical when they were 18 and 20, their first musical. And it was horrible about Dr. Bernardo setting up an orphanage. Uh, and they had tried to put it on and, and of course nothing happened to it. Their very next musical was uh, Joseph. Uh, but the songs were really catchy, were really great. So I became sort of enamored with the idea of what if I came up with a, a story, a different story for this, this, uh, for this musical, but the songs would still fit in. And so I, I, I had worked with Tim Rice on uh, Legend of El or The Road to El Dorado. So I, I said I had this uh, idea for this and I, I, I talked to him and his son who was directing it. Um, but I came up with an entire story and it's probably never going to happen. It was just a whim of mine. But for that telephone conversation, I was able to pitch an entire story and to use every single uh, song, pre-existing song. So finally, that sort of leads me to my last point, which is you have to enjoy the process. Obviously, I'm sort of trans uh, uh, porting over to, to more notes about the actual being a writer rather than the writing process. But you have to enjoy the writing process. If the only thing you look forward to is the premiere and the red carpet and the opening night party, you're gonna burn out really fast because those are far and few between. You have to find fulfillment in the journey. You have to, every day, you have to find something new and satisfying. Solving a story problem, I always say that writing is not about being inspired or having the muses descend. I always say that it's really about solving problems. You have to enjoy the solving uh, problem uh, the process or coming up with a new backstory for a character, writing a great joke. You know, in the end, you know, there are no big movies or little films. There's, I almost would go as far as to say there's no Hollywood films or, or, or European films. It's, movies and it's just you and the the blank page when you come down to it so are there any questions some of you i can see again some i can't I thank you philip for the great uh, <laughs> lecture and or your tips and interesting topics and now i officially uh, would like to open the Q and A session. So, firstly, our uh, lab participants, do you have any question uh, for Philip? Please raise your hands. Okay, and if if we could see them, 
Uh, yes. Could you, uh, could you please repeat it? Because I don't have a gallery view. Could you please raise your hand if you have any question? Okay. Uh, Philip, I have a question for you. Okay. I know that you don't like this categorize the children movie or um, family entertainment, but um, actually, what do you like in the writing process and why when you write the family entertainment film? Well, I, you know, this is, when you say that you have to write what you like, but you have to remember the audience, I always think that the, in a way, the best way to be a commercial filmmaker is to have very commercial tastes. So as it turns out, I like family films. I like animated films. I, you know, the, one of the reasons I, I signed on to do Pocahontas was because I loved the Disney animated uh, movies. I wasn't, you know, it wasn't just a job. I mean, I genuinely enter, uh, enjoyed it. I would say that Steven Spielberg, I think, is such a huge success because he loves the kind of movies that he makes. He's not, you know, uh, uh, writing down to, 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 to an audience. Uh, 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 what he likes, it turns out a lot of people like. I mean, one of the, 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 the more horrible experiences I had was uh, uh, writing or trying to write, uh, there was a series of films called The Problem Child. And uh, I took the job without really, with, without having seen The Problem Child. And then I, I, I saw the first movie, the classic Problem Child movie, in which I saw that this kid was, uh, uh, he set up a lemonade stand and he peed into a bottle and then was selling that as lemonade. And I instantly said, oh my God, I can't write this because I don't get it, I don't like it. But the guy who was the director and the producer uh, he genuinely loved this stuff. So he was perfect for it. That's why it was successful was because he loved it. It's a movie he wanted to see, but I couldn't do it. And, and I, I, I failed miserably because I just uh, didn't get it. So I, I you know, I, I, I like the, the, the humor. I like the, the, the world. I like the fact that um, it's, you know, I, I, I give this talk about Walt Disney's three secrets of, uh, uh, the, of movies, uh, but I like, you know, one of them is that it's, it's really a, a universe where justice prevails, where good, you know, conquers over evil. I enjoy that. Uh, uh, so it's just because I, 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 I love the, the world of the, uh, of the, the, the family film. Okay, thank you. I have another question. Uh, what's the main difference between writing for animation and writing for live action? Uh, you, you know, early on uh, the, in an early workshop, someone said to me, uh, it must be easier we're talking about character. I said, well, it must be easier to, to, to try characters for an animated uh, 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 feature. And I said, actually, it's much harder <clears throat> because in a live action movie, you can fall back on the actor. Uh, if you have Meryl Streep, you can get away with murder because she's always going to make it pay off. But in an animated feature, it's just somebody drawing some lines on a piece of paper or someone, you know, typing on a computer screen and coming up with uh, pixels. <clears throat> it is more important in an animated film to have a character with a very strong want and a very strong need with strong motivations. Uh, so um, I would say one of the differences, and you can see it now, is that actually animated features have to be better written than live action movies that usually, uh, if you look at, at a lot of them, they're more emotional, they're more structured, uh, they, they you know, have uh, better characters uh, because they have to. I mean, it's not just that you can't just draw pretty pictures. There has to be a compelling uh, a story. Uh, these days, 
it's difficult to say what the difference is between a live action movie and uh, uh, animated feature. You know, um, I was on the, uh, uh, the Academy uh, board, the writer's board uh, for a while when I was in LA. And it was at the time when they were coming up with a definition of what an animated feature was. And it turned out to be trickier than you'd expect because a lot of live action movies these days they have so much CGI in them, uh, not just characters, but 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 backgrounds and so forth. That if you say that the that the rule is that it has to be more than fifty percent animated, well, a lot of live action movies are more than fifty percent animated. Right now, honestly, the only rule that exists is people kind of know in their heart whether a movie is animated or not, but they can't really explain why it is. Um, how come these Marvel comic book movies with all their CGI characters, how come they're not in the animated feature category? Who knows, right? But everybody assumes, you know, as long as there is one live action character is probably not an, uh, uh, an animated movie. I would say though that animated features have to move much faster. They have to be tighter. Uh, they have to, uh, you have to think even more visually than in, uh, a live action movie. You can't depend on pages of dialogue uh, the, so much. You can come up though with exceptions to every single one of these rules, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have another question from a and I want user. to see Viola has a question. Okay, okay. Viola, please. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I have a question, uh, Philip, when you were uh, discussing the audience uh, that, of course, you said um, you don't know what the audience really wants, but somehow when you're writing, you have to imagine uh, the audience. And if you are uh, writing for a family audience, uh, how do you imagine the audience? Uh, do you categorize them in children and then also write some scenes for the adults how how do you how do you do this in your process well yes and no i mean again there's a contradiction here you have to write a movie you want to see but you have to think of the audience uh i think i'm i i, I have pretty i think the tastes of a general uh the movie audience i like in other words i will not usually write something thinking, oh, this is just for the kids. I, I don't like it. I don't think it's funny, but, but uh, the kids will like it. I, you know, if I write something, then it's something that I think is funny or I think is emotional or I think is amusing. What is true, and this started uh, to a certain extent with Shrek, I guess you could say, is that there are things often in an animated feature that only adults get uh, there were a lot of jokes in Shrek that the, the kids would get, uh, that the, the, the parents wouldn't, or more often that the, 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 the older adults in the audience would get that the kids wouldn't. When uh, uh, they, they come to Deloc and they look up and there's this huge tower and, and uh, sh the donkey says, well, I think he's compensating for something. One hopes that uh, the kids don't get that joke. <laughs> So there are a lot of there are a lot of references and things uh, for the adults. The idea being that uh, there are movies that parents will bring their kids to and then suffer through them, like the Pokemon movie. Uh, they do it as an altruistic act for their kids. But ideally, it's a movie where the adults sort of use the kids as an excuse because they wanna see the movie too. And that's true of a vast number of animated uh, features. And you also see a lot of young adults and teenagers who go to animated features. I don't know why we're just talking about animated features here, just on their own, because it appeals, you know, because they, 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 they wanna see it. So uh, that's in a nutshell, I guess. Okay, thank you very much. I have another question from our YouTube participant. How do you deal with very difficult conflicting notes from several different sources? Uh, well, sometimes 
you know, there is no solution to that. And that's when movies get into trouble. Uh, and I hesitate to say this because I know it, it's not just writers in the this session, but also producers and troopers and so forth. But I will say as diplomatically as I can, that the most important thing for people is they want to be heard and they want to feel that they're part of the process uh, and that they've contributed something. It's not necessarily that every single note has to be in there word for word, but they want to feel as if they were you know, invested in the movie. And when I'm working on a movie, I, I always try to be very open to what everybody says. I, as I, I, I like to think uh, Stephen Schwartz is much better at, at being open and welcoming to people than I am, I must admit. Uh, the, the, he's had huge, huge uh, the successes, you know, uh, the, the, for, for years and years and years, and yet, you know, it can be, you know, uh, the, the, the lowliest PA who will come up with an idea and he will react exactly the same way as, as from the, 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 the head of a studio. Uh, there are no bad notes uh, because even these, so to speak, worst note forces you to come up with an answer to it. Uh, and that answer often can force you to come up with a new way of approaching a character or a scene. Um, and often you will discover that it's people who have become so powerful and so successful that they don't have to take notes who get into big, big trouble. I think of George Lucas, uh, who for years and years and years hasn't had to pay any attention to anything anyone has said, even to a certain extent, Steven Spielberg. I mean, the biggest, their best days were when they were sort of peers with people and they had to take notes and they had to react and they had to uh, uh, make changes. And when they got beyond that point, then they go off into their own universe and the movies aren't as good. So uh, just be respectful, um, be diplomatic. Uh, you can say that's a great note without having to take it necessarily. Uh, give people credit, even more credit than they deserve. Uh, and most of these problems you can get around. Okay, thank you. I have another question from YouTube participants. Uh, how do you know the script is finished? It seems to me it continue co uh, correcting in forever. Well, yes, you I, I, I'm a big fan of deadlines. Uh, and you know your, your script is finished when you've met your deadline and you've handed it in. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, usually, honestly, the way that scripts become finished is people run out of time uh, because you can always futz with a script. And I actually think that the question, that, that the problem is more often that people keep messing with scripts too long than uh, sometimes too short. I did say that one of the challenges in Europe is that often because of the financing system, people have to whiz through the script phase uh, before the script is, is actually done. Um, and then you're in big problems because nothing is more important than the, than, than the script. Uh, but it, I, I have seen instances also where people just keep messing with scripts for years and years and years, and it doesn't get any, any better. In general, uh, I would say that you know a script is done when there are certain basic questions uh, that you can answer uh, to your satisfaction. You understand at every point why people are doing what they're doing. Uh, you understand uh, clearly what the movie is about and that everybody who reads the script understands the same thing, that your intentions are indeed on the, the page. But ultimately, honestly, it is, a, it is really a, a experience that tells you this, that you have to have a certain amount of self-confidence in yourself um, so that you're 
satisfied enough, everything can always be improved. Always. That's the problem is you, you literally, it is possible to never stop, but you have to, to say, well, this movie is working, you know, uh, uh, right now as, as, as well as I think it can. And that comes with experience, I think. Okay, thank you, Philip. Uh, I have a last question from our lab participants. Uh, how came that in Disney movies, all mothers are dead and why? <laughs> Because mothers are the most undramatic characters possible. Because the second that you get a, a, a mother who is in conflict with the main character, the audience just hates her because she's not a good mother. Uh, on Pocahontas, Michael Eisner said, I just want one thing. I don't want our mother, to Pocahontas' mother, to be dead because I'm tired of people coming up to parties and, and ragging me continually about, you know, the fact that the mother is dead. And we said, okay. So we had Pocahontas' mother. She was this kindly woman who was always in the background, you know, cheering on her daughter and the, the, the crowd or, or, or so forth. But the trouble was that the story was that Pocahontas' father was going to kill the man that she loved. And there was this conflict between father and daughter that was resolved. The mother wasn't part of that story. And ultimately, we said, what if she's the wind? <laughs> what if she's the colors of the wind? And so, you know, she became dead again. Uh, there's, some, there's some movies now where it's, first of all, there are some, some uh, uh, movies where The mother is alive and the father is dead. So I guess that's progress. Okay, thank you very much, Philip. Uh, uh, thank you for your great lecture. And if you have any questions, please join to our YouTube uh, channel. And then there will be chat uh, coffee when you can um, like meet with um, Philip virtual. And uh, now I think that Maciej would like to uh, say a few words. Yeah, I can just only comment that uh, uh, as a distributor and festival organizer, I got to say that in Europe, the deaf mother solution for drama is also existing. Uh, uh, That's so sad. <laughs> this kind of extent that we are sometimes avoiding buying some films for Poland because we cannot distribute mostly deaf mother films. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, um, shortly about uh, the lab that Philip is mentor of uh, at the moment is fully boarded for the next edition. Um, we are working with series and features, uh, uh, live action animation and documentaries. And we'll start the workshop um, this January. But the open call for the next edition, which is international, so from different parts of Europe, you can apply with your project. Uh, most probably will be open around uh, next August. So if you are cooking up something uh, for a um, uh, family audience, then uh, um, please think about more or less August as a moment when we will announce our next call. <clears throat> And uh, this webinars for those who are together with us for all webinars this day, It's been a sort of long day. Uh, it's a part of our Kids Kino Industry yearly program. Kids Kino Industry, in fact, is an event in September in Warsaw. And it's a co-production pitching event for live action animation docs series and features from all over Europe, but also other parts of the world. Um, and I wanted to thank you, Gdynia uh, Film Festival for uh, hosting us here. Uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, very personal uh, thank you to Tomasz Kolankiewicz, artistic director, uh, who invited us here as well. Uh, thanks to all partners that make uh, this event uh, possible. Um, and I think it's time to slowly move to the chat on YouTube if you want to continue this discussion. I just would like to mention yeah. that um, you are very welcome to join us also next Tuesday for our next uh, Kids Kino Industry talk from uh, 12 to 13, uh, where we provide you a session on the new normal about insights on new kids media behaviors and uh, new media trends that will probably stay with us also for the next year. Our guests will be uh, Pete Robinson, uh, Chief uh, Strategy Officer of Kids Know Best, um, a UK-based research and content consultant agency. And he will uh, be in talk with um, Eric Huang, 
Uh, he is a children's media consultant who has worked in children's media for over 20 years in um, various roles for Disney, Penguin, Mindy, Kent and Lego. So please um, uh, watch out on our website um, where you can have more information about this session next week. And last but not least, I wanted to thank to uh, Kasia, the project manager, Viola, the head of programming, but also to Joe, who was uh, supporting us here technically, uh, and Ula, who was supporting us with the uh, Q&As. Uh, have a good night, then. Yeah. Thank you, Philip, again. And thank you, all lab, Kitskino Lab participants that you joined uh, to us today. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>